Praise God. I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to this uh, session. This is uh, the session of uh, the Health Nugget. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Daniel Mokaya. Uh, I'm a pharmacist and I also teach in uh, the university. Today, we are going to look at an overview of cervical cancer management. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that thou hast given us even to look at the health of our bodies. And we pray that as we go through this uh, session, that thou will lead us to get something that will help us so that we can be healthy and available for your work. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. As we look at uh, the issues of uh, cancer and especially cervical cancer, which we have uh, been focusing on in uh, the last series of uh, nuggets that we have been giving from uh, this pulpit, and uh, this is uh, New Life Seventh-day Adventist uh, Church, Nairobi, uh, Kenya, for the online uh, viewers. We have uh, built up a scenario that we are now saying that uh, there is need to focus on cancer and especially cervical cancer. If we look at the statistics, that is the numbers that tell us about uh, the severity of the condition in terms of the data that we have from the year 2020, out of 100 new incidents of cervical cancer, out of 100 new persons who were diagnosed with cancer, 11 of those were cervical cancer cases. Now, worse still and sad still, out of 100 persons who died of cancer in the year 2020, 10 of those persons whom we refer to as the mortality cases were cervical cancer cases. Now, in terms of treatment of cervical cancer, the treatment for cervical cancer depends on several factors. And this will be decided between the patient, whom we call the client, the team of healthcare providers. Of course, there could be also the caretakers and the circumstances which are surrounding the client of the patient. And this includes the stage of the disease at the time of diagnosis. And we all know by now that there are four stages from the first stage up to the fourth stage, which is the worst. It also depends on the patient age, the patient's general health, and what other conditions the patient may be suffering from, the patient's individual circumstances, which also depend on the social surrounding of uh, the patient, of course, the patient preference, and that's why it's important that the patient or the client has to engage the healthcare team, and of course, the fact that Cervical cancer itself and cervical cancer treatment can affect the ability to have children later on in life, and this will need to be uh, decided together with the healthcare team. Now, the healthcare provider, the healthcare provider will work with the patient, with the client, to develop a care plan that may include one or more of these options. That is, once the diagnosis has been made, the client, the patient, and the team of healthcare specialists will work out what is best situated, suited for the patient. And this could include the following. There are six. One, surgery. Two, radiation. Three, chemotherapy. Four, there is what we call targeted therapy. Five, there's what we call immunotherapy. And six, of course, we don't forget about the need for nutrition. Now, 
importantly for this audience, what is important, because I do not expect you to learn about treatment so that you can treat yourself, but it is to empower you to know what you should look for, even as, sadly, if it was you, or a loved one, or somebody you know, has to undergo treatment for cervical cancer. So this is what the healthcare provider should be asked by the client or the patient. Now, there, is, there will be need to ask what are the treatment choices that you or your loved one or anybody who requires treatment needs to ask what are the treatment choices, what treatment is recommended for me, the patient, and why. Is there a need for a second opinion? And this is important. And your healthcare provider will let you know whether there is a need for a second opinion, and of course, they will redirect you or uh, tell you where to get the second opinion from. Now, next, it, they'll be need to know what would be the goal of the treatment. That is, as you are receiving treatment, or your loved one, or, or whoever is receiving treatment for cervical cancer, what is the overall objective of the treatment? What should be done by the patient to be ready for the treatment, and how long should the treatment last? So if there is a need, it is important to ask those questions, including the fact that what are the risks or side effects, and this is important because sometimes cancer patients who are being treated of cancer, and especially cervical cancer, will get a whole range of side effects because cancer treatment sometimes actually destroys your cells when you are a patient. And therefore, you have these issues like loss of hair, uh, malfunctioning of various body organs. But once you are aware that this will happen, then it does not take you into surprise and lead you probably to have stress and uh, anxiety, which may lead to depression. It is also important to ask, are there things that uh, one can do to reduce the side effects? How might the treatment affect your daily activities? Will the treatment have an effect on your arriving at menopause? That is that as, 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 as a woman who is being treated, it, it, it may lead to arrival of menopause early. And this, you need to ask your healthcare team. You need to find out if the treatment doesn't work, what then needs to be done. And of course, it has been found that it is necessary to be able to let the patients who are being treated to know that it may be necessary to refer them to a mental health specialist because the treatment itself and the disease itself loads a lot of stress on the patient, which can lead to anxiety and sometimes to depression. So a mental health specialist may be required, and it's better to find out uh, as uh, the treatment is being initiated. Now, let me say a few things about the actual treatment. One, chemotherapy is a drug treatment that uses chemicals to kill the cancer cells. In everyday life, when you hear people talking about chemo, they will, in most cases, be referring to the treatment using uh, drugs for cancer. Although chemo, basically chemotherapy, means treatment using any drugs. And as we, we all might be knowing, when you use any drug, if you don't use a sufficient amount of drug, then in pharmacotherapeutics, in healthcare, we say that the disease will kill you. But if you use a small amount, a suboptimal amount of the drug, then or if you use an excess amount of the drug, the drug will kill you. So it's a balance. It's either the disease is killing you or your cells, or the drug itself is killing you. And this is true for chemotherapy because these are toxic chemicals, and they are toxic because they have to kill the cancer cells. Of course, they are given by all manner of roots, and the healthcare provider, your healthcare provider, or your loved one's healthcare provider, will provide the information to surgery. And there are various types of surgery which are performed. 
It could be from a simple hysterectomy, that is removal of the uterus, or it could be radical, where the uterus and several other surrounding tissues are actually ectomized. They are removed. And this will be explained to you when the need arises by your healthcare provider. Radiation therapy, and this is what we call in everyday uh, life, uh, uh, radiotherapy, and this is where uh, high-powered energy beams of X-ray are used to actually kill the cancer cells. And as I, have always, as I have already said, when you are killing the cancer cells, it's like when you are using a weed killer. The weed killer will actually kill the weeds, but in the process it may also kill the grass or the vegetation or the other crops that you have, uh, you have planted. So it is important that um, one is aware of this because then that leads to death of other cells and this therefore can be a cause of several side effects. We also have what we call targeted therapy and uh, immunotherapy, which are also uh, areas where uh, management can be, can be used. Now, let me say a few things about uh, nutrition. There are certain foods that are important to eat. These include better carotene-rich foods like carrots and peaches, because they contain vitamin A. Folic acid-rich foods like dark green vegetables are important because they contain folic acid, important to these patients. Citric, citrus food fruits like orange and lemon, which of course contain vitamin C. Whole grain cereals, which contain, of course, the bulk, and of course they contain a whole range of vitamin B vitamins. And then we have lycopene, which you will find in tomatoes and watermelons. What you need to avoid is anything that is rich in sugar, especially soluble sugar. But you will work with your healthcare provider, especially the nutritionists in this. Now, as I finish, what is the role for the caretaker, relatives, and friends, you and me? One. Support the person with cancer as best as you can. Sometimes simply your presence and nearness to this person is sufficient. Keep up relationships outside the family. Relatives and friends are needed for support during recovery. Try to continue doing the things and recreation that have previously been a source of strength, especially as you interact with these patient undergoing treatment for cancer or cervical cancer. Supporting someone who is ill is easier. But first of all, you as the caretaker, as the relative, as the friend, you also have to discuss whatever your problems are because you might be a caretaker of a patient undergoing cancer therapy, but it is important that you also take care of your needs because it's when you are healthy, and active is when you'll be able to take care of the needs of the cancer patients. Be available and tell the person who is ill that you are there and you care about them. If the person is sick and withdraws, it is important to remember that, that uh, mental health specialists are important. Cancer supportive services are also important. This is palliative care is available. Remember that palliative care is not only for the terminal cases, it starts immediately the diagnosis has been made. Remember, there are four partners. The patient, the healthcare professionals, the relatives and the caretakers, and of course, the nutritionists and the other persons who are responsible for the treatment and management of the patient. Remember that be there for the patient and always have the positive faith that we have from the book of Hebrews 13 verse 5 where the Lord has told us that never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And when this is done and you are healed of your cancer, you will be given the bell which you will ring to tell everyone that I have been healed and you will be an ambassador for cancer treatment and for the saving and healing power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, may you teach us these things that you have told us. 
that we may be healthy, we may be available, and we may preach your message because you have power over sickness and even power over death. May we stand by the promises that you have given us because we have prayed and believed in Jesus' name. Amen.